All right, so in the last video, we talked about how to solve the heat equation using separation of variables. And what we ended up doing was assuming a solution that is a product of two functions. Each one is a function of a single variable. Then we did the separation of variables in this way. And we set both equations equal to some constant that we call the eigenvalue lambda, such that we essentially reduce this partial differential equation into a system of two ordinary differential equations. And we talked about how for this one involving the second derivative of this function phi, we needed to essentially consider three different cases. So the three different cases that we need to consider are with respect to the value of that eigenvalue, because so far we don't know whether it's going to be zero greater than zero or less than zero. So we need to consider three possible solutions. And these ones are the ones that we came up with for each of these cases. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to apply some boundary conditions that hopefully will allow us to solve this equation. And what we're going to be looking at in this video is what it, we often call Dirichlet, Dirichlet boundary conditions. And essentially what these are is that are boundary conditions that tell us the value of the solution. So in this case, we, we're going to talk about the solution, the general solution um, as a whole, are going to tell us something like this. So let's suppose that we have something like a one-dimensional rod that has length L, and it is positioned on the x-axis in the following way. So that's zero, and this is x equals to L. And we're going to assume that basically the temperature at the initial, well, the temperature of both fans is just zero. So this, that's just the boundary because that's, um, the heat is not really dissipating at the end. So that's what we're going to assume here. So basically we write the, the boundary conditions in the following way. So this is when x equals to zero. So that's at that point, we're going to assume that the heat distribution is zero. And basically this is the same as saying that the value of this function of x is zero. So basically this reduces to this since we know that the solution is uh, a product of two functions like this. And we need two boundary conditions, of course, because we're talking about a one dimensional case. So we need one boundary on each end. So that means that we need two. And then let's have the second one at the other end also be zero. And this is the same as writing phi of L equals to zero. So these are the two boundary conditions that we have. So now what we're going to do is we're going to apply these ones to each of these solutions, and hopefully they're going to help us realize or determine which one is the most appropriate solution for our case. And we'll see that with separation of variables in simple, in simple uh, differential equations like this one, it often becomes quite obvious which one is the right solution. So let's start with case one. So what we want to do is we want to set this function equal to zero. So let's start with this one equals to zero. And now if we put zero in X, that's going to be B. So that means B is equal to zero. And now if we apply the second boundary condition, we're going to have zero. And then this is going to be a L. Now immediately you see, well, a can L cannot be zero because we just defined it as the length of the rod. So obviously L is not zero because it doesn't lie here. So that only implies that the only possible solution to this is that the constant A is also zero. But if both constants are zero in that equation, then that means that the whole solution is just a zero. And that, that doesn't really make much sense because we want to essentially model the heat distribution across the rod throughout time. So why would we have zero heat uh, going through it at any point in time. That really doesn't suit our purposes. So this is what we call a trivial solution. We are going to completely ignore that and we're going to move on to the next case. So this is just a little bit of a, a trial and error and just trying to see which one we can discard and which one we need to consider. So let's have the second one. Let's set this equal to zero. So we're going to have both of these are going to become 1, so that's going to be a plus b. All right, so that's one equation. Now let's have another equation. Let's have 0. And now we're going to have 
a e to the power of l lambda plus b e minus l lambda all right so now we have we have two equations we have two unknowns because remember this is just a constant essentially so what can we do to solve this well what we can do is we can first of all we can express one of these variables in uh, one of these constants in terms of the other so let's say we we set a equals to mi <coughs> minus b and then we're going to substitute into this equation so that means that we're going to have minus b e lambda l plus b e minus lambda l equals to zero but hang on a second i mean the we know that these are constants because l is non-zero we know that the eigenvalue is also non-zero because we already discarded the first solution which assumes that the eigenvalue is zero and now the only possible solution to this equation is that b is also zero that's the only logical choice that we have that's the only way that we can solve this so this is this is a really interesting term of events because that means that if b is zero then a is also zero and this whole this whole solution becomes zero so obviously this cannot be the solution either so we're gonna discard that one as well and we're gonna move on to the third case we're going to move on to the third case so what we're going to have is phi at zero is going to be what it's going to be this is going to become a because that's one and this is zero so a is zero that's fair enough now let's have the other boundary condition so now we know that a is zero according to this so we can discard this cosine function so we're left with this one and now we're going to write b sine l square root of lambda so now we have two choices we can either we know that this is not zero right and we know that well if we set b equal to zero we have the same issue that we have been dealing with but there there is one thing that we can do to this there there is a way that we can make this uh function here sine of l uh, square root of lambda zero and that is by somehow relating this to some multiple integer of pi so remember that the sine function is defined as follows we have pi two pi and so on two three so basically we know that for any multiple integer of pi we're going to have a zero we have a zero there a zero there a zero there and so on so basically we can write this in general form as n pi because that means that n is going to be one two three i mean of course it can take a negative values as well and we can have zeros there but we're going to consider just the the positive integers and we're going to exclude zero because obviously if we put zero in it we're going to get a solution that is zero so we don't want that so now what we're going to do is we're going to set l square root of lambda equals to n pi and you might you might be thinking well how can we use this to solve well this actually gives you a value for the eigenvalue and that's a really really interesting thing because that's something that is useful for solving this equation if we solve for the eigenvalue so we're going to write it in the following way the eigenvalue or the nth eigenvalue of this equation is going to be equal to n squared pi squared over l squared so here we just learned two things the first of all we can represent the, the value eigenvalue lambda as this so that there's an infinite choice of values for each integer n that goes from one to three and so on and the second one is that because we solved we found that the solution corresponds to this value so so essentially our lambda is going to be less than zero then we can set up the following equation so the solution to phi of x is going to be equal to b and sine n so we're going to have n pi x over l because remember we have square root of lambda here so basically this is just going to be one of the solutions because remember we need to choose one integer here and for each of those integers we will have a different solution and you can imagine that for each of those solutions we're going to have a different constant here so that's that's that implies that in order to obtain 
the actual general solution to our problem, we need to consider the superposition of all those possible solutions. So in the end, to write a general expression for phi of x, what we're going to do is we're going to write it as an infinite sum. So an infinite sum from n equals to 1, bn, sine of n pi x over l. Because remember that if we put n equals to 0 here, then the whole solution becomes 0. So that doesn't really make sense. That's just like adding 0 to this whole sum, which is just pointless. It's redundant. So that's why we start the sum from n equals to 1. So this is, in essence, what we're going to be obtaining for phi of x. Now that we have solved for this, of course, we need to consider what is going to happen to the solution for our t. So we have t here. Now, because we already said that the solution corresponds to, to the case where lambda is less than 0, we're going to make this negative. So that means that t prime over t is going to be equal to minus lambda c squared. And now if we integrate both sides, this one with respect to t, this one with respect to this big t, we're going to get the solution a e to the power of minus lambda c squared times t. And it all was because we already found the value of the lambda. We, we're also going to have uh, an infinite number of um, solutions for t. So basically the more general form would be minus c squared n squared pi squared over l squared t. So this is going to be our solution, and of course, a n. But in general, because th essentially, when we multiply the two solutions together, this constant should get absorbed into the other constant. So we can usually just treat this as 1, because in the end, when we solve for the constant b n, which is something that we will do using Fourier series, essentially, this is the same as calculating both constants simultaneously. So we're going to be left with this expression. So what does this tell us about the problem? Well, the problem for this case is going to be the following. For this case, what we're going to have is, oh, I'm going to have to del delete some stuff here. So let me just get rid of this so I can write the full solution. Okay. So in the end, our general solution for this equation, or... I should, I should say particular solution because remember that we applied very specific boundary conditions to the problem. So this would be the particular solution. n equals to 1 uh, goes to infinity of bn sine n pi x over l times this function, which is going to be this expression right here. So minus c squared pi squared uh, n squared L squared times T so this is going to be our solution for this particular problem now to find the constant because obviously we need to find all those constants all those coefficients bn what we're going to apply is a Fourier series and this is something I explore in, a, in a, another video but for now we're going to focus on First of all, finding general solutions due to equations like this one using separation of variables. And then we can start using Fourier series to find the coefficients to find the really the particular solution to this. And to do the Fourier series, we need to introduce an initial condition. Remember that an initial condition is uh, a condition in which our function of time is has some value at zero. So that's the initial condition. In the next video, we're going to be solving this for different boundary conditions, and we'll see how that compares to this solution that we have here.